So I'm unmuted now um, and I'm ready to speak into this microphone. Uh, my name is Paloma Kopp. I'm an electronic media artist and I live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, thank you to the folks at the Edmila Lab for inviting me to this. Um, what you just saw was uh, an excerpt from my piece, which is called Magnetic Field Recordings. Um, and that piece is a part of my series called Electromagnetic Earth. Uh, so I'd like to talk about some of the ideas and the experiments that I've been working on uh, in the series. And it's still in progress, so I'm not sure exactly what the destination or the finished result will be yet. But I think that sharing your process uh, can be very helpful, both to myself as an artist and maybe uh, inspire other people in their work as well. So yeah, so let's get started. Um, so quickly, uh, I just wanna go over a couple of the ideas behind the series. Um, and uh, some of the inspiration that I'm taking from different uh, concepts from science and research that I've been doing. Um, it's a little bit of a winding journey. So uh, you might see some of these ideas manifesting in different forms in different uh, experiments and videos that I'll be showing. Um, so, the first one is deconstructing the boundaries between uh, the ideas of nature and technology. So, there's this idea of separation between uh, human beings and the rest of the world. Uh, but, of course, humans are part of the world and the devices that we build are based on uh, the properties that are present in the world, um, you know, independent of us being there or not. So we have an inter interdependent relationship uh, with the world around us. Um, and, uh, and then there is the invisible world of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, I'm interested in exploring this because um, we're surrounded all the time by electromagnetic activity, but since we can't actually see it or experience it with our senses, uh, we don't actually think about it very much. But there's a lot of activity happening, especially in the radio spectrum, that we can use different uh, devices to detect and make visible or make audible, make into something that you can see or hear. Um, and the last idea is, uh, and this might make more sense when I show some examples, um, the parallels between feedback processes and uh, the, the Earth's landscapes. So how, um, you know, processes with computation such as uh, recursion, iteration, kind of go in parallel with uh, how some of the land formations like mountains and canyons and things like that um, are formed. And uh, yeah, so let me start off by showing um, some footage that I've been uh, making recently using ferrofluids. Uh, ferrofluids are this kind of black liquid that you see in this image. Um, it, it has iron particles in it, so it's responding to magnetic fields. Um, and in a way, it kind of gives a method for making these magnetic fields visible.
So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the process um, that I use to make this, but basically I'm moving a magnet around underneath these fluids and um, it's causing them to move and create these branching patterns. Um, it's also mixed with uh, glycerin and alcohol. So that kind of yellow color that you see in the video is uh, the alcohol is kind of uh, dissolving some of the oil out of the bare fluid and mixing it with the rest. It creates almost like a watercolor looking effect. Um, so yeah, the process of this is um, uh, the, the most recent ferrofluid videos that I've been making. Um, I was using uh, two sheets of plexiglass um, that are both placed flat on the table and the liquids are in between these two sheets. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, the fair fluid is being mixed with alcohol and glycerin, so that gives it a kind of uh, base or a background for, for the fair fluid to move through. And uh, the magnet is being held um, in my hand and it's being moved around and kind of tilted and manipulated underneath the table. Um, so the camera has a macro lens on it because uh, these patterns are, are very small, just a, maybe a couple centimeters wide. And I can see what I'm doing in the camera monitor so I can kind of adjust how I'm manipulating the magnet according to uh, how, how I want it to move. Um, so if you're familiar with my video work at all, you will know that I work a lot with video feedback, um, especially as a way to uh, perform video live. So I was interested to combine the ferrofluid footage with video feedback especially because um, it's producing some very similar patterns. It's actually quite surprising how similar the ferrofluid looks to the video feedback. Uh, so just to explain what video feedback is in case anyone hasn't seen this before, basically you're just taking the output of the video sig signal and putting it back into the input. So you can do this by pointing a camera at a screen, um, and then it creates this kind of infinite mirror effect type of thing. Um, and you can also do this with a video mixer, which you can see on the right side. Um, in this talk, I'm, I'm just going to be showing some feedback using cameras. So we won't talk about that as much, but I wanted to mention it. So here we have um, uh, the result of my experiment with combining these two processes. So when I do live performance, um, sometimes I combine uh, footage like this, like the ferrofluid footage, which I've recorded beforehand, and I combine that with video feedback, which I'm performing live. So I actually used this um, footage in a couple of performances that I did lately. 
And uh, I think it was very interesting to see how those two processes combined. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about video feedback and um, feedback systems in general. Um, this diagram here at the bottom is kind of the basic idea. You take the present state of the system, whether that's, uh, you know, a frame of video or, you know, what things look like in the present moment in general, and then you perform a set of operations or changes, and then you take the new state of the system and you repeat the process over and over. So um, as you can see with the video feedback, um, it can create very unexpected patterns, um, a lot more complexity than you might expect to see with such a simple system. And that's because it's kind of caught in this infinite loop um, of uh, recursion and it can create uh, these very organic patterns. Um, so let's see. Uh, this is a sculpture that I created out of glass, and I wanted to show this as an example of uh, creating something that looks kind of like, uh, you know, a geological formation using video feedback. So here is a video of the piece. Um, you can see a little bit better the depth when you're looking at it like this instead of just a still image. You can see it looks a little bit like maybe a valley or um, a 3D map of a, some kind of land formation. And so this is created using, <clears throat> using a series of layers of glass and each layer has a shape laser etched into it. So this is the source, uh, the source imagery um, that I used. So I kind of traced out this shape in each of these frames and then etched it into a piece of glass. And I wanted to show you an example of this type of natural formation um, from stone that looks kind of similar to the sculpture. This is a, a photograph that I took while I was hiking in the mountains um, here in New York. So the rock is in these layers and then this water came through and it carved this shape into the stone and it's revealing these layers of rock that were already there beneath the surface. So it's kind of um, taking this uh, iterative approach where, you know, maybe a little imperfection in the, in the side of the stream starts to form and then it gets bigger and bigger every time the water comes through again. And you get these very intricate organic formations. Uh, so, um, I wanted to go on a little bit of a side tangent um, with some experiments that I did using um, this 3D fractal rendering application called Mandelbulb 3D. Um, I was trying to see if I could use this program to produce things that look kind of like a landscape. Uh, and I think it, it did come out looking very similar to some kind of rocks and mountains, but uh, of course it's a bit different because there's sometimes things floating in the air and and it's, mo it's you know, the movement is quite different than you would see in a piece of stone, but So that was um, fun to experiment. Um, Mandelbulb 3D 
is a free program that you can use on Windows, I believe. And uh, the only thing is you have to render each frame one by one. So I rendered all of these frames and then I joined them together into a video. So I haven't really used this footage for anything yet, but um, that was an, uh, another example of how you can use mathematics to produce these kind of organic shapes. So um, next up, I wanted to talk a little bit about field recording. Um, of course, field recording is part of the title of the piece, but uh, it's kind of part of my practice in general, even outside of that particular piece. So these are some of the devices that I'm using to make recordings um, out in the world. And I'm interested in recording, you know, I have some of these uh, normal acoustic microphones where I can record sound, uh, but I also have some radio receivers that I can use to record uh, electromagnetic radiation, um, whether that's being output by some kind of human communication system or whether it's just you know static being produced by the sun or uh, some kind of waste uh, you know radiation being spewed out from some uh, electronic device which is leaking EMF. So yeah um, the main the main receiver that I'm going to be talking about or which I used in this piece is called the Soma Ether. It's a very wide band uh, radio receiver. So if you kind of walk around and search for different uh, EMF signals, uh, even if it's in different frequency ranges, you can still pick it up with the Soma Ether. Um, and I like to attach kind of a piece of wire just to use as an antenna so I can get a little bit more range. Um, and I, I want to go on another quick tangent here um, to mention that if you don't have access to um, radio equipment or if you can't, you know, get out and about to make a recording, um, there's another tool that I like to use called WebSDR. So you can find that at webSDR.org. And I will just show you quickly um, the interface for this. So, yeah, you can see this. Um, just for example, this, this um, antenna is at the uh, University of Twente. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly in the Netherlands, but there's receivers all over the world that people have made available. So you can just visit their website and you can actually access, you can access the live feed from their radio antenna and you can adjust the frequency and kind of scan through. This one doesn't actually have so much uh, activity right now. You can see this uh, is mostly just black, although we can hear a little something. So you can kind of travel around the world in this strange way and uh, hear some of the electromagnetic radiation that these antennas are picking up and some of them are very powerful. So it can be interesting because, you know, we wouldn't normally have access to this type of equipment, but it's, uh, it's just, you know, free to use on, on the internet. So these, um, these lighter lines here are different signals that are being put out. So some of these are 
you know, people talking to each other or just a normal radio station. Some of them are uh, machine signals, different equipment talking to each other over long distances. And uh, some of it is just interference, you know, from the sun, from different radiation sources. Um, even lightning can produce uh, some interference as well. So um, just another way to explore the electromagnetic world around you. Um, so I'm going to just show an example of a field recording that I made where I attached a camera to the um, Soma Ether so that I can record uh, audio and video at the same time. So the audio is coming from the radio receiver. Yeah, so you can see all these kind of sources of um, of radio frequencies and radiation are, you know, the fluorescent lights, uh, the turnstile, which is made of metal. So all of the metal in the subway system kind of helps to uh, transmit all of these frequencies and amplify them. So. Uh, it's interesting to walk around in the subway and you know walk up to different uh different electronic things and and listen to the the emf that they're putting out uh but i also sometimes walk around outside as well um near power stations um cell phone towers and different things like this um so i have another example to show you. Um, this one is recorded inside of my home. Um, so I was experimenting with processing the video, so it's a bit more abstract. So you can kind of see the relationship between uh, the movements of the camera and the changes in the sound. So uh, the angle that you hold the antenna of the radio receiver makes it you know, will change the quality of the sound. So you can kind of see um, how you can explore in space in that way. Mm -hmm.
so I'm I'm kind of walking around and uh, placing the antenna close to different types of light bulbs and uh, different devices that I have. Um, a lot of these devices are not built to produce this kind of radiation, but they do, and it's actually kind of um, a sign of inefficiency. Um, but for, for exploring in this way, it's actually quite interesting. Um, so I just have one more example um, to show uh, how I was experimenting with processing the video uh, from these recordings. And this one is even more abstract. Um, I was trying to go for uh, kind of like the lines of elevation on a topographical map. So uh, just, just for fun, I wanted to compare this um, to this animation of the fluctuation of the Earth's magnetic field over the last uh, 500 years or so. Um, you can see the lines, well, the way they fluctuate, it looks kind of similar to that video and you know it's hard to get um these kind of visualizations of a magnetic field um you know this one was produced by some scientists of course but normally we don't really get to see this this kind of fluctuation so um that's one of the things i'm trying to uh, make make accessible or make visible to people in my work. Um, so the last topic that I have for today is I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the oscilloscope imagery uh, in the piece and, and how it's created. So if you missed the excerpt at the beginning, um, this is just a still from the video where you can see this white shape in the middle um, is produced uh, with an oscilloscope. And um, I'm uh, using uh, the oscilloscope on the bottom actually here. Uh, but I just wanted to mention the how some of the properties of different oscilloscopes can change the quality of the image. Um, because the uh, material on the front, the phosphor, um, which is actually translating the beam of electrons into visible light, uh, you can get screens with different phosphor coatings, and that can change the color of the image on the screen, and it can also change uh, the decay time of the image. So how long it takes for this image to fade. So here I'm showing kind of the difference of two different um, oscilloscope screens and just a little bit closer view. And the sound that you're hearing is the, the same sound which is controlling the, this image. You can see in this screen kind of the, the image kind of takes a moment to fade into the background um, because this phosphor is a little bit slower than the other one. And then here you can see there's not so much of a trail behind it when it's moving around. So we don't really think about screens as like a physical material normally but these phosphors are you know made from different materials and um it's 
it's changing the quality of the image and it's um, affecting, you know, how we're able to see these signals. And so, you know, I'm recording these images by showing them on the oscilloscope and then pointing a camera to record it. Um, so it's it's actually a more material process than people might imagine to make you know electronic work, but um, just to show kind of the materials that I'm using here, I'm using um, two different uh, synthesizers to uh, produce the signals. Um, one is called Phosform, um, and it's you can see it here. It's made from a Raspberry Pi with an additional uh, audio interface kind of hat that it's wearing. And then this one here is called the Oscilloscope Graphic Artist. Um, it's a, a little board um, that you can kind of build yourself and it's made specifically to produce interesting patterns on the oscilloscope. And so these two um, scopes that I'm using are, this top one is a, a modified Vectrex. So that's a, um, a vector-based game console, which I modified. And then the bottom one is called Leader LBO 51A. So um, this is the one that I used uh, to produce the oscilloscope imagery in uh, the, the piece that we're going to be screening, magnetic field recordings. Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully that gives you some idea of the processes that I'm working on um, with this series and with this piece. Um, thank you for listening. And uh, I think we're going to have a discussion now with Ida. Um, hi, Ida. Hi, Paloma. Thank you. This was really amazing. And um, I'm really happy to have you here. It would be even much more lovely if we could have had you have you in uh, at Ludmila in person. But then again, in this virtual space, I think uh, it really worked fantastically to uncover how and on what kind of levels you're dealing with different kind of way of sensing and also different ways of virtuality, maybe. And uh, for the first question and what kind of really triggered me with this uh, last two uh, the, the uh, one before last example with the really sensing of the electromagnetic field environment, um, it really um, kind of struck me that um, virtuality is actually a strong, um, uh, a, a strong element in your work, but it's not, uh, although you work so richly with um, visuals, uh, it's actually a sonic virtuality and something that Salome Vogelin would perhaps call sonic possible worlds and um, just having an, a different kind of imaginary of a world around us. And I'm quite curious what you think about this kind of different ways through your work trying to present different ways of looking at the world and this kind of different way of virtuality which is not connected to the the visual but rather to audio and different kind of physical senses yeah that definitely makes sense yeah i think um it's interesting to work with both sound and video because like sometimes the visual sense can kind of take over and you you want something you know to look at it feels more real but the sound is actually what creates like the sense of space a lot of the time. So um, to be able to manipulate both of those at the same time, you can create like more like an environment as opposed to just like an image or something. Um, so yeah, I think um, like I, I kind of think of a lot of my recordings as like trying to create a space and of course, it's not the same space as 
the physical space that you might be sitting in a room or whatever. So in that way, it's kind of like a virtual space. Mm. Yeah. Um, and um, just before we continue, um, uh, I failed to mention that, of course, uh, you, the public is very much wel welcome to have any comments or questions on YouTube. And we already received a, a question um, from Karen uh, Karen, and I think as it connects to some equipment that you were talking um, about before, maybe we could e uh, quickly answer it. And she says, um, does the receiver have a built-in recorder or do you have to connect it to the recorder? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the receiver doesn't have its own recorder. So I, I had to connect it to my a uh, Tascam audio recorder. And actually, because it's being connected by a wire, that is changing the, the properties of the sound as well, because uh, the recorder or the receiver can pick up some of the EMF that's being produced by the, the Tascam recorder. So I tried to keep them a little bit farther away from each other so I can just get the EMF from the space. Um, I also tried plugging it into the microphone input of the uh, camera as well, but it was way too hot of a signal, so it was a little scary to see the levels peaking on the, yeah. Yeah, and especially New York is um, extremely, extremely loud. So it's um, it's really good to take care of your hearing. And in lines of like um, the audio um, recording that you get, how much do you pay attention on uh, post-producing your audio? Because of course you use audio as some um, kind of a tool with which you affect the visuals. Similarly, as you spoke about feedback loop in which visuals reproduce visuals. But in this case, um, you also like with, with the oscilloscope, you use sound to affect the visuals. But uh, speaking just about sound, do you post-produce it when you record uh, EMF uh, field recording? And um, because by my experiences, a lot of the times the pitches are extremely, extremely high for human hearing in the um, translation of the EMF to audio. So how do you handle that in your work? Yeah, it usually makes sense, like you're saying, to add a little compression at the very least and maybe a little bit of filtering because you know, if the high frequencies are just overpowering, it can be a little bit abrasive. So I think some people that are working more in like the noise music realms, like they actually like it and they want it to be like sharp and painful. Um, but for my work, I want to kind of smooth it a little bit and create a space that is actually a bit more pleasant to exist in as a human with, you know, good hearing. Uh, <laughs> so I do, um, uh, some the recordings that I showed as an example, like when I'm walking around with the camera, like those I didn't process because I wanted to show you like the experience of going out and making the recording. Uh, but in the piece and in, you know, usually when I work with these sounds, I do, um, I do change them. And I'm also, you know, I'm mixing in signals that I'm generating uh, with different instruments, like I showed with the Phosform and the OGA. Um, those ones are, you know, just pure signals that are being produced. So I'm kind of doing some mixing of different signals. And I'm also, you know, combining them in different ways, you know, with modulation and things like that. So it's not like just, you know, pure raw audio recording that I'm using. I'm uh, working with it in like a sound design or maybe also kind of a musical way. Yeah, that's what I wondered because with the subway recording, it was like very raw and <laughs> yeah. Um, in that, um, then coming to what you spoke 
a lot about and I think kind of you you kind of uh, um, presented a piece that you're still or a series that you're still developing so I think that uh, there's still a lot of things that are suggestive but what I think it's very strong in electromagnetic earth is um, trying to um, uh, not just do biomimicry but actually trying to detect what kind of cosmic environment are we living in what what produces our our cosmic um weather for example you know and um i think that th this kind of uh, solar flares and the the historic picture that you showed at the end uh, is really informing that and i think um what well, what what is your like kind of i um, this is maybe still very early question to 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 ask but where do you think how do you think this uh, will expand which direction do you think it will go will you make kind of this landscapes where you go more into the cosmic realm where where is this pulling you this electromagnetic earth yeah i think i think i do want to go more into the cosmic realm uh <laughs> so uh you know i'm showing you know electromagnetic earth and the properties of the planet that we live on that interest me of course like as you go out into the atmosphere more there's also you know solar wind um the interaction of the earth's magnetic field with the solar radiation and how it kind of shields us and creates these uh rings of charged particles around the earth in you know expanding into space and um, I have some ideas also. Um, so I have like some spherical balloons uh, that I wanted to work with some kind of projection mapping. I did one, uh, I did one performance uh, using projection mapping onto the sphere. It's like, uh, you know, taller than me. It's like really huge. <laughs> so I'm, I'm interested in like exploring not only this planet, but also other, you know, kind of creating the idea of other planets and how to portray them um, using video and sound. So creating like environments that aren't necessarily based on the space, like this piece, you can see like the footage in the background is all just pretty much just camera stuff it's not you know being processed or manipulated that much so you get the sense of like the space of you know the world and our kind of normal visual field but i think that there's like room to go further outside of that as well mm. so basically it's um um maybe not so so much really alternative worlds but different ways of looking at the same earth um, in that respect. Well, one thing that also interests me quite a bit, and I think a lot, a large part of your work is uh, connected to this um, very fluid processes. I, I think that the ferrofluid fluid um, example that you showed and also the oscilloscope are in a way very material, um, but at the same time, very fluid and very kind of chaotic and what you also mentioned that you're interested in complex systems and i'm wondering how your studies of science in physics and mathematics informs the understanding of those complex um, processes yeah it's kind of it's it's an interesting balance so you know i when I was studying in school, um, both in both in my undergraduate and graduate, like I was able to um, study some math and physics courses. And uh, to me, it's kind of just like makes it more interesting, I guess, because sometimes it feels like art, art is just looking at art. And that art is also looking at art. And then your whole day is art. And like it's like there's other things in the world happening that you can bring into your art and like 
um, take influence from, which are not necessarily like considered to be art normally. So that's just kind of like what interests me as a person more. But it's a little bit hard to say like what, like, so it's like, okay, you, you learn about science, you learn about math, and then you go and do your practice. And the ways that they influence each other is not really like so direct. It's more like changes how you approach it and your way of thinking. So like, there was this one time when uh, m my physics professor came to like a video performance and like I saw him afterwards and he was like, oh my God, like the periodicity of the rotation was like so crazy. And it was like cool, but then also like I like brought this like cymatics piece that I was working on like to show him. And I was like, what do you think is like happening? like?" how is this even you know occurring and he was like oh i have no idea but i don't think you should worry about that like just make the piece you know so it's like um i think there's a lot of interesting possibility for like collaboration between scientists and artists but to say like exactly how that's going to work like you can't really predict i guess um so I'm not really trying to like, uh, you know, do science at all in my work, but the f like the things that I learn have influenced how I think in general about the world. And I, that's something that I do want to share. Mm, amazing. Yeah, I, I, I think also that what, what was for me quite revealing when diving deeper into these EMF spectrums is that what you mentioned as well with playing with the radio and uh, software defined radio, SDRs and different kind of pickup methods for radio waves is that at certain point I just realized that um, radio is just electromagnetic field only on a much wider range and when you start to look at also the, the light and everything as a part of electromagnetism, then the view of the entire reality just becomes very different, right? And um, with the radio, uh, I'm, I'm curious, kind of this is kind of an experiential question. How did you actually get into um, listening to EMF field recordings? Did you enter it from the point of view of the radio spectrum and then realizing that after the radio spectrum, there's so much more of the frequency range that you want to explore? Or was, was it vice versa that you first encounter a EMF detector and then? Um, yeah, so let's see. I, I think my first like interest in radio was uh, listening to shortwave systems or shortwave signals uh, using just like a normal, you know, world receiver little, and I think I showed it in my like picture of the different things that I use for recording. So the shortwave radio is, is still one of my favorite things. And um, I guess like, there's like so much going on in that band uh, with like machine signals and like, you know, you have the universal clock station uh, and all these kind of like strange little oddities. Um, there's like uh, videos on YouTube if you look up like shortwave mysterious or there's like number stations which are used by like spies and, you know, all this stuff. Um, so uh, I, I always liked to, you know, when I'm walking in, uh, in the woods or something, if I get to the very top of a mountain, like I always like to take the radio out because I can get so much more reception up there, especially like around, um, you know, dusk when the sun is setting, the ionosphere like can transmit, you know, like signals from, you know, all the way around the world because it's bouncing off the ionosphere. So 
I um, just kind of like uh, nerding out about that. Um, and I do actually have a like amateur radio license, um, which I had to, you know, become certified in order to obtain certain uh, radio like equipment uh, that I use. So I think that radio waves are one of the most interesting things to experiment with, but it also just happens to be the thing that we can obtain, you know, receivers for. Whereas for like ELF, you know, other types of bands that are not as useful for communication, we can't really obtain that equipment. It's like more for scientists and people that are measuring, you know, the different uh, EMF spectrum that is not used by humans as much. But um, yeah. So that's one of the great motivations for the artists to work with scientists to get a grip on, yeah. on the best equipment for um, low frequencies or, and stuff like that. Um, so, um, yeah, um, maybe um, now it's already the, sort of the time for us to uh, go and experience one of your pieces, the one that was announced as a screening um, for this digital dish. I think that this is going to be a very wonderful experience. You've already presented quite a bit about it. We try to speak about it, but I think it will only reveal when we see it. The title is um, Electric Field Recordings, and it's the first video of the series of Electromagnetic Earth that I think it's going to be co cosmic and beautiful. And I wish you to have very many editions and very many pieces in the series. And thank you for such a wonderful presentation and talk. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I recommend also check out Ida's work um, <laughs> under the name Beep Blip. Uh, she does some wonderful recordings as well. And I'm so glad I got to talk to you because I know that you mm -hmm. You work with this kind of stuff too. And yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah, we could nerd out, but I had to stop us. <laughs> <laughs> okay.